You're listening to Cards to the Moon, a podcast about trading cards from both a collector and investor perspective. We hope you'll stick around for the ride as we take a deep dive into the state of the hobby, share some hot takes, hopefully some useful advice and fun stories along the way. Hey guys, welcome to the Cards to the Moon podcast, and we are recording episode number 37. Hosting today's episode is myself, Clark, from Five Card Guys on Instagram, and as always, I have Hyung from Integrity Sports Cards and John from Trade You at Recess with me. So normally at the end of each episode, we always ask for your questions for future episodes, and we got a few over the past couple weeks. So I thought in today's episode, off the top, we can answer some of those questions and feedback we've received, all right? Uh, We actually addressed one feedback already from Chris about doing more hockey on the show. So if you missed last week's episode, we introduced a new segment called Hockey Highlights, where John gave a couple of great top five lists of both modern and vintage hockey cards to invest in or just to collect. So you can listen to last week's episode for your hockey card fix. Another comment we got uh, was about a couple of times we talked about FCG grading, which is forensic card grading, and how it seemed we were touting them as a great grading company without much reason why other than using them to help determine whether it's worth sending over to PSA with all the subgrades that FCG offers. Hyung, I'm gonna let you address this first since you're (laughs) really the only one from this group at least uh, to date, to have used their services. So, Yeah, and I only like talk about this because it's a service that I needed, right? Mm. So Mm. you got to always remember like I need subgrades that are affordable because some of the raw cards just don't just don't justify kind of like the premiums that PSA or BGS has, right? So for me, um, I guess a lot of people ask like – I was blown away by their service. Like that's one thing as a customer, just straight up unbiased. Mm-hmm. I, I own zero FCG slabs before. Um, obviously I did my due diligence on it and yeah. And it just made sense for me as a customer. So uh, just like SGC did as well. Right. So I know there's a lot of like uh, discussion regarding like card value, like will it hold value? But I think that's something we see over time. And to be honest, it's the people that, um that are part of the hobby essentially are going to be the ones buying you know um fcg graded cards right so the market will be dictated on how people respond to fcg as a whole as a company right so for me as a customer i just view it um a service that was needed at that price point right and that's why i was happy as a customer i got exactly what i needed um Mm -hmm. In terms of value, I I won't know. But I do know that, like, for instance, I graded it a Bobby Witt Jr. Auto, a Refractor Auto. And a PSA 9 at the time was probably selling for $1,500. Like, to me, my FCG 9 was probably a PSA 9, I'd say, um, if I went PSA. But for me, I wouldn't sell it under $1,500 anyways. Like, I'm, I'm holding that until, you know, the market you know, tells me to, to sell. And when it reaches that, you know, $2,000, $2,100 mark, that would be a comp, right? So for me, as time progresses, and the, the main thing is what I see is they're attacking the Bowman Chrome market, like the first Chrome market. And to me, I feel like that's a smart strategy just because um, it's niche. It's over time. There's there's some valuable cards like the Bobby Witt Juniors that are finding themselves um at record breaking sales and they happen to be in a FCG slab, right? Not saying that it, it's it has happened, but I've seen colored Bobby Witt Jr. So time will tell. But mm-hmm. at that price point, I, I don't see it struggling, honestly, in terms of the ROI, because we buy the card, not the grade, first of all, right? So for me it's as that Bobby Witt Jr., you know, goes up in value, it's the card that goes up in value, not really the grade. It, it's just justifying what what you're willing to spend on that particular card. And if FCG is grading on based on a very fair assessment in terms of you're getting the grade what it actually deserves, then they might have a, a lot of value to people that are looking for kind of like the same service, right? With Which is cheap subgrades, right? And in the Bowman Chrome market, that's something that's needed. So 
yeah, long story short, we we not we're not getting paid <laughs> for for <laughs> FCG. Definitely not. Um or any any company for that matter, right? So right. um yeah, I just wanted to clear that up. But yeah, I was very happy with the service. I was very happy with SGC too, right? So for me it's like as a customer, I'm gonna probably send a lot more cards to SGC and FG fcg moving forward mm-hmm. that's just the way the market is dictating right now right it's nothing more or less than the fact that a service is needed it has nothing to do with how much are my cards are, are going to be worth because if i made the investments in the right cards then i don't really you know um try to play the game on just solely graded like the grade is what dictates the value right i'm i'm looking at it from more of a the card dictates the value from a long mm. long term perspective. Right. Right. Yeah. I think I think you know in this new new age of grading everybody's been used to submitting to PSA or BGS or whatever, kind of rolling the dice on the PSA 10. If you get it, you 3x, you 5x, you 10x your money or whatever, and that's kind of been everybody's thought process in how grading works. But I think the point about FCG is not that Number one, it's like an amazing company. We're not trying to necessarily pump their tires. But if there's a company and they've shared, if you go onto their website or their their Facebook group, they share exactly how they do the grading. They use like those, you know, those professional machines like that, that use like a microscope to look at all the edges and the trims and the corners. So if they end up giving like a gem mint grade for 30 bucks, that gives you the confidence to either maybe sell it and somebody that appreciates FCG will give you value on that. Maybe yeah. not, but at the minimum, somebody like Hyung can take that card and be like, you know what, in the future, if this guy blows up and I'm still holding on to this prospect, I can now have a little more confidence to send it to PSA and I think this is going to become a PSA 10, right? right. Hmm. So, And another part of this is when you look at all of the new pricing that's coming out, like I think in this in this new world, you shouldn't be afraid to kind of invest a little bit of money into your cards, right? Like with FGG, just just to find the gra- the, the grades and and have it slabbed, have it protected, and then people seeing it can see the grades for thirty bucks. That's not bad. You you invest a little bit of money into it. Um, let's say you know a gr- uh, actually a really good option is SGC's new um, five day express mm-hmm. for fifty bucks. Let's say yeah. in two weeks, I'm going to go to like a sports card show in Toronto and I'm holding on to a 54 uh, top Gordy Howe, raw. I had it like my grandfather had it sitting in the basement. There's nothing wrong, you know, that you can imagine the consumer confidence in, in knowing that this is an authentic card. I'm going to send it to SGC for 50 bucks on Five Day Express and I'm going to get it authenticated, not even graded, just straight authenticated slap for 50 bucks. And then I walk into that sports car show and I have an authentic, authenticated 54 Gordy Howe. Like, you know, it's not necessarily about the ROI or the 2X or the 3X, but sometimes it's you, you, you invest a little bit of money to give other people or whoever you're trading with or whoever you're selling with a little bit more confidence to bid on your card or to, to you know, to, you know, pay, buy your card. Right. Because a lot of people are going to be hesitant, like especially this whole raw world. Everybody is hesitant to buy you're looking at pictures. You're not looking at it in person. Um, if you can give somebody a little bit more confidence for thirty bucks, for twenty five bucks, I mean, yeah, to each his own, right? And raw, raw card reviews at Beckett right now, I think they're at forty bucks, right? And that doesn't include subgrades. So for me, it's like find me a grading company that's gonna tell me my grades on the four, um, you know, uh, areas that grading companies look at. That's what I want. Period. And I want them protected and slabbed. And I, I, I pay 24 bucks uh, for 50, 50 and over right. uh, with FCG and 30 bucks with SGC. And I was very, very happy. And that's all I'm sharing. It has nothing to do with anything else, you know. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was just pl- a pleased customer. And you know what? I will be using them again, both companies, because I, yeah. I find value in, in building my collection as well. Right. Yeah. Right. No, that, I just, yeah, that's great that we got that comment so we can clarify where we're coming from. For me, you know, and you know, we all don't agree 100% on each grading company or the value that we put on each grading company, which is fine. That's uh, we're just respecting everyone's opinion. But for me, I look at the macro, like what I like about FCG and any grading company, uh, to be frank, that's coming into the game is this increased competition can only be better for collectors, for hobbyists. Absolutely. Because, you know, in theory, 
if one grading company, a new grading company does a great job and takes some of that market share, I would hope that that will put pressure on PSA and BGS and even SGC now to do a better job in providing good service for their customers. Mm -hmm. So I look at it more from a macro lens. I don't have any cards submitted to FCG personally, but I'm, I'm looking on the sidelines to see how their market share grows. And if there's always a point where I'm going to jump in, like I did with SGC. Like I was just kind of watching them. And, you know, before SGC, I was more exclusively buying PSA and BGS like a lot of collectors. Right. But then when the PSA and BGS sus suspended their services, now what? And you look for alternatives that are good to go with. And you see right. like, oh, a lot more people are slabbing their cards with SGC. That gave me confidence that there is a market for SGC cards. And why can't that happen to other grading cards companies like FCG? And I think the more options we have as collectors, the better. Because ultimately, when we want to get into that flip game, or even for the investor types, um, to have a company that can offer a service, a reliable, good service for cheap and quickly, is, is yeah, that's what's missing right now. When It was missing when PSA and BGS suspended their services. And, and now um, we have options, which is great. So... So that's what I like to see as a collector. And, you know, the more grading companies I get, and not all of them are going to survive. Obviously, there's so many out there that we haven't even mentioned on the show. But we need more than just two or three, I think. And, you know, let the collectors decide where they want to go. Mm -hmm. Good now, point. The most now, the most important question is why does every grading company use a three-letter acronym? <laughs> it's is just there, a standard it's, yeah, is there some sort of rule that i don't know that you have to name your company it's psychology it's so funny you know what well look at bccg it's not it's yeah not great. yeah just one, one extra ladder <laughs> i don't know it's not great i just want to see somebody come out and just call their company super cards or something like instead of <laughs> Well, we'll see if that ever happens. I don't, I'm not betting on it. But, I know. <laughs> All right. Uh, we actually have one more question that we can address on this episode. And this one's from Brian, who messaged us on Instagram. And he says he's not a big baseball card collector, but he would love to buy a Vladdy card in the $200 to $400 range to hold on to going into this coming season. Hopefully that there is a season. Um, and he, he did uh, reply back. We don't have to stick strictly to the $400 max limit because that might limit the options. So let's just say anything under $1,000. Is there any Vladdy card that you would recommend to Brian to hold on to as an investment um, over the over this coming season? I'm actually sticking uh, to under 500 because that's oh. kind of, I, I, I feel <laughs> like that's more realistic. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity, I think, floating in that range, especially that 200 to 400. Sure. And that's, that's the thing. It's... Um, I think there's a lot of uh, cards of Vladdy's that are still cheap, that are still underpriced. Uh, one specifically, uh, his 2016 uh, First Chrome Refractor PSA nine. I think it. Uh, I think in the last couple months they sold between four to five hundred bucks, and that's a numbered refractor of his First Chrome. It's obviously non-autoed, but nice. um, I'd imagine a PSA ten is probably going north of you know, two and a half K. So for me at that 400, 500 for a PSA nine, I don't think, I think there's a big, you know, uh, discrepancy in terms of a PSA nine and a PSA 10 price. I don't think there's, you know, that, that big of a difference, um, or should be. I also think there's a lot of opportunity, um, you know, with your X fractors, your PSA nines, X fractors that are floating around 250, 300 bucks. I think those can easily grow, um, especially because everything's um, like the, the staple is based off the PSA 10 price, right? So, and mm -hmm. then sure. you go into pop counts and see, hey, you know what? The PSA nine of an X fractor shouldn't be that big of a difference. That's the way I, I, I see it when it's, you know, less than, you know, 20% of the PSA 10 value, that, you know. There might you might find a lot of value in that PSA nine is what I'm saying, right? Especially for a card that's probably very similar in terms of grade um, overall, right? So, and I lastly I'll throw this out there. Um, I do think uh, kind of like the tops update. I know it's not the desired image, but Vladdy doesn't really have paper parallels, mm -hmm. right? So I think there's a small market uh, for tops update, even though it's it's very cheap. So you could get a tops update, you know. Uh, a gold, I think, for like 300 bucks, a BGS 9.5. 
um, which is uh, the paper gold, which we all know, you know, obviously Trout's update has a paper gold. And then you look, your Tatis, your Sotos, all those golds do well in the long run in terms of the paper. And uh, there's also in the update, there's a SP and an SSP. Um, I know the, uh, the SP updates, uh, PSA 9s, you could grab for about two, 300 bucks, which is dirt cheap. Um, and as well as the SSP where he's holding the, the baseball, it's a horizontal card. Raws are selling for uh, 475 bucks, 500 bucks, right? So there's a lot, a lot of options, I think, that um, that is in play, I guess. But again, it's, it's there, because in 2019, I, I find they started printing a lot in terms of the higher prospects, like your Vladi, Tatis, your Acunas. They have a boatload of rookie cards, so... I always say, you know what, the first to go up will be your Topps Chrome, your your flagship, your NNO, your Topps Chrome. And then mm. uh, and then all these alternatives kind of follow, like the Bowman Chromes, the Topps Updates, the Sterlings, and, and whatnot, right? So, yeah, that's kind of where um, my head's at. I think there's a lot more opportunity to grow with even these, you know, cheaper cheaper slabs. I think there's so much value uh, in them. If you get any numbered you know, Vladdy at this point, you know, for under 500 bucks, I think it's, it's a great steal. You know, I like, um, when prices are this low, especially when you talk about flagship, like tops Chrome, when prices are low and you look at the refractors that are not numbered, the prices are usually pretty tight together, but as the player becomes a superstar and his prices start to shoot, you're, you're going to start to see some big time separation between pink refractor, refractor, prism refractor, X fractor. So right now, I think Vladdy's cards are tight enough that there's a lot of value here. So if you look at like, I'm going to go above the 400 range, but if I think it would be good to spend a little bit extra and be a little bit more protected in terms of print run and pop pop reports. So, for example, pink refractor is at like 400 for PSA 10. A regular refractor is at like 450. A prism refractor is around 500. And then I would argue, I think the good buy is stretching just a little bit above that. And around 550, 575, you get the X fractor, right? And if you look at some, for example, if you look at <clears throat> even Tatis, who's just a little bit ahead of Vladdy, like his pinks are like 450, 500, but then his X fractor is like 1,000, 1,100, you know? So I think when Vladdy, you know, if we're all kind of predicting Vladdy's going to another, have another big year, I think a card like the X-Factor PSA 10, um, not only is it liquid because it's a Topps Chrome flagship, it's also liquid because it's a PSA 10. Those are like the two greatest, you know, characteristics of liquidity when you want to try to get rid of a card. Um, and I think the X-Factor is a great buy at 575 or whatever it is at right now. It, it has a really good chance of 2Xing or 3Xing by... Uh, beginning of season by the end of next season who knows but something like that even um something for me uh the vladi tops chrome sapphire psa 9 which goes for around 550 if you wanted to stretch your money again it's a it's a psa 9 it's not the 10 but again you're you're protected by print run right i don't know in 2019 how many sapphire sets were there printed like less than 500 um so i i for for me i like those two cards yeah a lot of great suggestions. Um, I don't have much to add because Hyung mentioned like about seven or eight. <laughs> 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 no, it's just good for Brian. <laughs> he has choices, right? But um, yeah, for me, it's. I think when I saw this question, with uh, Vladdy being the stud that he is, and we're all you know bullish on Vladdy's upcoming season, I'm looking at like the PSA nines of numbered cards. Um, as a good play and you guys kind of already addressed that because if he repeats the season those cards are going to go up and the scarcity is already built in because it's numbered or if you can find a cheap auto like you know i know right now like i just just kind of looking quickly and his autograph cards are um, a little bit more expensive but if you could wait deeper into the off season i'm looking at card ladder and you know surprisingly his tops chrome base um, rookie auto is is not as expensive as you might think right. compared to like the Bowman Chrome. So that's you know like I think the last one and this is sold in September October. So it's been a, a few months. Uh, so that might have changed. But the last one of a PSA ten sold for seven fifty. Wow, Top Chrome. Cheap. Yeah, yeah, and really then the, cheap. And the, 
And in September, the one before that was about 600. So, you know, it kind of ebbs and flows in terms of the price. But if you could catch it on the dip, if you see one guy listing it for around that price, um, yeah, it's a little bit more than the four or $500 budget. But for an autograph, PSA 10, at that price range, I think, I think it's a good deal. But yeah, I hope that was helpful for, for you, Brian. And uh, for anyone looking to invest in Vladdy, uh, we're all bullish on him and we're all expecting a great season for Vladdy too. So, all right. Thanks so much, guys, for the questions and comments. Um, if you want to ask a question yourself, you can always DM us on Instagram at Cards to the Moon, or you can reach me at Five Card Guys as well. And you never know, we might even have a new segment around your question or comment in future episodes. So, we definitely do appreciate all the feedback that we've been getting so far. All right, let's move on then to our main weekly segment we call Hobby Headlines. All right, so. The big news in the world of professional American football is that we on this podcast are allowed to discuss football because we weren't completely wrong about who's going to the Super Bowl. (laughs) If you you guys remember, we said last week we would never talk about football in this podcast if we were dead wrong again about our Super Bowl picks. It was close, (laughs) man. It was close. The the Chiefs let us down, but the Rams pulled through for us. Barely. (laughs) At the very end. At the very end. (laughs) So let's talk football. And of course, really the big news is Tom Brady's retirement. First, was that a surprise to you guys? It was, yeah, actually. It was. <laughs> it it mm-hmm. kind of caught me off guard so. for sure. For a lot of us, yeah. Like yeah. I think a lot of us were thinking, oh, he'll come back for at least one more season, right? Yeah, right. No yeah, doubt he cut- physically can. Like, I mean, this guy, mm-hmm. this guy's yeah. the GOAT. For sure. Right? Yeah. For sure. And I think maybe it's because he does have a few business ventures that he can go to i think that probably and his family of course but yeah i think his kid pit plays hockey so he's gonna be more involved there as yeah. well so yeah, do you geez. guys sorry this is off topic but did you see that your ichiro comment no no so it's pretty funny because in 2018 apparently uh tom brady texted ichiro he got his contact from a rod and yeah. ichiro was like who the f is tom brady like, yeah, no clue. And then it's 2018. But there's like memes going around, but I thought it was hysterical because Tom Brady actually wanted to reach out to Ichiro to ask him what his secret was to keep, you know, playing yeah, yeah. at that mid 40s age, right? Yeah. In 2018. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of his response. But that, that's what I thought about when we we're, we were just talking about this. But, anyways, go on, Clark. <laughs> uh, that's funny. That's. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> I wanted to actually talk about his rookie cards in light of his retirement news, but you could have guessed his best rookie cards are out of the price range for most collectors. So let me ask you instead, do you have a favorite Brady rookie card that you would buy if you had a lot of money, just for fun's sake? Yeah, I would probably be in on the Bowman Chrome Refractor for sure. Um, Okay. I think uh, either that or the contenders. Um, obviously, that's kind of like the the grill. I think another one broke another record. Uh, yeah, uh, the playoff right. one for two point three. But uh, yeah, I I think uh, either his refractor or contender auto. Yeah, top top two for sure. Yeah, John, <laughs> John, you got one. Yeah, for me it, it's easy. It's for me. I love the SB authentic. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. There's something about. Maybe not. Maybe I'm subconsciously going back towards upper deck, but there's just something about that card. I just like the way it pops, like that white background, and then he's kind of wearing that uh, Patriot sort of like warm up jersey, the red. Um, yeah, I just like that card a lot. So if I had a boatload of cash and I'm going for like a Grail Brady SB Authentic PSA 10, probably goes for around 150k. That would be a Grail for me. Nice. Yeah, not much more to add. I think the top three are the ones you just mentioned, guys. So right. the contenders, the Bowman Chrome. I think the Chrome is the first, is the first, if not only, Chromium stock card, rookie card that Brady has. So that's that's nice. And then and the SB Authentic numbered to 1,250 is a pretty sweet card to have right. as well. Johnny, I think I know a guy selling one if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Remortgage your probably- house. Even for a PSA, <laughs> even for a PSA seven, I probably have to give up my entire collection. It was in the high rollers room. <laughs> oh man, which which grade so is it? Oh, I saw that the uh, PSA ten. Yeah, the PSA ten. Yeah, he was wow. asking. For, I think he was asking for like one forty or something like that. Yeah. Oof. Jeez. Yeah. Okay. Well, 
yeah, it's pretty much out of our price range. But what I did want to talk about, though, speaking of Go players and their rookie cards, we mentioned it before that in the hobby, many collectors try to attain these GOAT cards by essentially flipping and trading up. Like, that's the end goal for a lot of us collectors, right? But you have to make the right bets on lesser players and, and even time the sale right to keep moving up. So what might be more useful for a lot of our listeners and a lot of collectors is do you have any strategies you use to try to trade up for these bigger cards? Any kind of advice on what you can do to hopefully attain one of these Grail cards? So yeah, the what what I like to do essentially is um, get more liquid cards and kind of um, I don't mind putting extra money into a trade too. So when I trade up to a card, I'll trade multiples plus a little bit of cash, right? Um, and then once I get kind of like a bigger card, what I try to do is I try to kind of like lock that up and see where that goes because they're they're tough to come by. I know the flip would be rewarding on some cards to you know cash out on a big card like that, and there are times when you do when when you feel it's right, right? But I don't think uh, a lot of people do. Uh, it's not realistic for them to drop like a five figure of cash, you know, into one card or six figures for that matter, right? So if I see all combinations of crypto, you know, trade for cash or trade for cards for slabs and then half, you know, PayPal or whatever it might be, right? So mm. I think trading up, um, focusing on, you know, players that you think are going to be great and those big cards that, you know, could potentially spike up in value where you're not really invested too much in, where you could get you know, when the time's right, you you maximize that value or vice versa. If, if a, a player is on the downside, you know, that's when you want to trade for them, right? So when, they're, when their price is low, you trade a, a value that's more higher to receive something um, of lower value, right? So, yeah. And we always joke with you, Hyung, that you love volatility. So like what kind of players do you like to target that has that volatile kind of um, potential? I it it would have to be those um you know goat type players or at least the big prospects that you know um that are on the dip because it, you know I remember we talked about John Morant uh, earlier in the season he was a guy that you could pot potentially see okay his cri- his prices could go bonkers because we've seen him before right so uh, if you were to buy you know a, a, a big jaw in the off season and now his his card has, you know, tripled in value, let's just say the one you have. And, you know, a Justin Herbert is in the mix now that he's out of the, you know, uh, playoff contention or Super Bowl. Um, and his values kind of go down a bit where John Morant is high, right? This is a perfect opportunity to kind of, you know, look look and time that market where you're maximizing your value on a particular card, right? And maybe buying into a card that's a little cheaper at the time right and then you could throw in some cash where you know what maybe that john morant was 200 bucks that you spend and you spend another 300 bucks and then you get like kind of like a two thousand dollar card for that 500 hundred dollar mark or whatever it may be or the combination yeah. right so um yeah just being creative with stuff like that yeah yeah good advice yeah the, the liquidity being liquid is probably the key um, i think everybody should number one realize most people right now <clears throat> trading up is a big thing. So most people are looking to trade up. So even if somebody's hanging on to a Grail Brady card that's $10,000, most likely they're wanting to use that $10,000 card with another $10,000 card to get a $20,000 card. That's what most people's strategies are. So number one, you have to understand that there's a small population that usually is willing to trade downwards. And if you are, if you do happen to find somebody that's willing to trade downwards, you also have to have you know, your best bet is like under five cards to trade up. Like you're not going to want 35 Soto PSA 10s trading upwards. Like that's not going to happen, right? So everyone is going to have to grind a little bit and take some of your little $200 cards, $300 cards, turn that into something liquid in the $1,000 mark. Like, you know, like a Trey Young Trey Young Silver Prism PSA 10, trade up to that mark. Now this is something that's around a thousand, that's liquid. Get another one of those, get another, you know, get two two more, and then use those to get a Luca Silver at three thousand dollars, and then somehow work your magic again and, and start to build that way. And I think once you get into three to four, three thousand dollar cards. I think then you can have a conversation with somebody that's hanging on to a $10,000 card that just happens to be wanting to look for some cash 
and you've got the right liquid cards for him, and then boom, a deal could happen, right? So I think the word liquid in terms of the trade world, whether you're going up or down, is the big is the big word of the day, right? So Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And when we think of liquid cards, I think it goes without saying you have to do your research, see what cards are in, in fact liquid. Like what are people buying? Right. right. And um, you know, card ladders uh uh, we're not being paid by card ladder either, but it's a great tool to use to see what sales are and even going to sports card shows like you, you just kind of get a good gauge of what's selling and what's not. Right. So so and, you know, sometimes you learn the hard way too. like you might think a PSE nine of a certain card would do well. But, you know, if the market starts to tank a little bit, then there's all of a sudden no market for PSE nines because PSE tens are more attainable. So, you know, usually you try to get the best grade. Um, at your price range, whatever you can afford, um, you know, if it means to spend a little bit more on a PSA 10 or BGS 9.5, you know, that's always good advice too, because those are usually more liquid than the lesser graded cards, right? right. But yeah, no, you just got to do your research. I think what I will add is, you know, uh, maybe diversify a little. Like I like the idea of going after volatile price cards where you could see a spike, but you never know, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, you know, some might just not see that spike for whatever reason. Injury, like there's so many different reasons athletes um, can get into trouble. And and uh, we've seen it before with a number of players. So I would diversify a little bit, maybe have like, I like to have three or four players I like to target that I think are low priced or like a good deal. And you're just hoping for one to really spike. And and right. then you, you, you could cover the cost of the other ones you're investing in, you know, um, even if another one of those cards goes to zero, right? Like, mm. like, um, and, you know, in terms of more practical advice, like I like to target players that are, you know, I, I mentioned this in previous episodes where, you know, they have all the potential in the world, but for whatever reason, they haven't put it together yet. Maybe an injury like Shohei Otani two seasons ago, mm. he got injured, you know, he has the potential, he has the pedigree and, you know, the, the tops chrome auto that i got was 500 bucks like it was way too cheap in my opinion right. and this year like lewis robert we're all high on lewis you know he's uh um coming off an injured season so he didn't play the full season but what if he puts it all together and you know we talked to scotty um last week uh, scotty baldwin of scotty b cards saying like his war if he stretched it out for the season is 7.0 which is amazing mm-hmm. so if he could put a full season like that and you know where his car prices are at now in the off season, you know, you could easily, I could easily envision that doubling um, as well. And then you could use that cash to trade up for uh, a bigger card as well. So yeah, just kind of doing your research on what's liquid and also doing your research on players themselves. Right. Like why is, why is this card not worth as much as it should be? Right. And how much confidence do I have in this player to reach his peak potential for this season or next season? Right. So yeah, and you know, it's, it goes without saying too, just have fun with it. Like it's always, it's always fun going, rooting for a player with like, you know, where you're like, oh, this guy's going to be awesome. And then you, you see that happen, you see that play out. And then, uh, yeah, it's amazing to be able to, all of a sudden you have a one $2,000 card that you bought for one $200 and then, you know, just building your collection that way. And then, and then you go buy a box and rip. Because you <laughs> yeah. think you're up. <laughs> the ultimate gamble. The ultimate. <laughs> you just got to throw that in there because I know a lot of uh, listeners will, will be like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> With that profit, enter a few razzes. <laughs> yeah, enter a few razzes. You just never know, right? And then you start all over. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Repeat. Rinse and repeat. All right. All right. Okay, so yeah, you know, it's, and oh, one other thing, one last thing I'll mention is to be patient, you know, like if you want a 10,000 or five figure or six figure card, like that takes time, right? right. <laughs> to build up, to build, build, build up. Like you can't expect like, oh, I, I invested a thousand bucks and all of a sudden it's worth a hundred thousand. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think, I think that's the biggest misconception is that, right? Is the, it's, it's quick money, you know, it's like a lot yeah. of variables can happen throughout the year you know it's a it's kind of an emotional roller coaster if if you think about it but if you watch sports it's it's great right yeah it's a lot of fun yeah. and the people that do make those huge um profits are taking 
huge risks as well, right? Absolutely, like, yeah, you know? for sure. High risk, high reward, right? So, yeah. All right. Speaking of GOAT type players, before we head to the next section, um, Serena Williams, her SI Sports Illustrated for Kids rookie card just broke the record for most expensive women's Insane. sports cards sold ever, selling at one hundred seventeen thousand dollars. It's crazy. That's that's uh, awesome news, though. Great, yeah. great news. Yeah. Love it. I, I say insane, not that it's because it's Serena Williams. I say insane because um, I don't know how much, you know those SI for kids cards? Yeah. Like, I don't get the hype as much as other people do. I get it. It's usually an older card versus, like, their main tops or whatever main release. But I know that in, within the card market, you can't actually sell, like, a physical card if if you deem it as a card, you have to get it licensed. So Sports Illustrated, you can't. They couldn't get it licensed, so they print it as a page, a part of their magazine, and it's just right. a. It's basically a cutout, like it's a piece of it cardboard. Cutout, you, yeah. you cut out. It's yeah. not officially a card. So to see something that's not officially a card and it's meant for like a kids magazine, that becomes like the best of the best, like Serena's, and then you got the Tiger Wood SI. Man, for, there's a part of me that's like, I just. I understand that it's, and I don't get it at the same time. It's it's so it's so <laughs> wild to me that it, yeah. that's that's like their main rookie card or whatever. But anyways, the, yeah. I, I I just think that those though like think how early they got them. That's that's why because it's mm. it's like they are predicting that these guys were goats when I think Tiger Woods it was 1996 his card right and you know mm. his rookie card five years later you know um, in 2001 right so. For me, it's like that's a huge collect- collector's item for Tiger Woods, like a Sports Illustrated for kids, right? So, um, yeah, I get, I get it, John. Like it, it comes from a magazine, and it, some people even have like the full magazines, which is cool, right? And right. that's why people even look in on, on the Tiger Woods cards that the perforated is perfectly. <laughs> you could see the the teeth of the perforation, and if you don't see it, then that means it's trimmed. Uh, you know, and there was a lot of stories of trimmed cards uh, on on that you know particular '96 Tiger Woods Sports Illustrated. But yeah, that Serena Williams um, it, history just repeats itself. Like I said, it's like the the SI for kids is a is a strong brand in the in the community of of cards, believe it or not. And mm-hmm. I, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised actually. Um, with that sale because there's been, you know, multiple Serena Williams sales in the five mm-hmm. figures of her net pro, her, her glossy, like, um, all those cards that are, you know, uh, closing in record, uh, sales this past year in 2021. Right. So it was just a matter of time before, you know, a PSA 10, a very rare card of like Serena, like a sports illustrated, you know, goes for, what it what it went right so i i think it's it's great for the hobby and i think there's a lot of room to grow for you know cards even that particular card you know i i see a serena williams psa 9 uh the sports illustrated selling for a thousand bucks right and that's pot and that's pot 43 so if 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 a psa 10 sells for 117,000, which is pot three deal. Right, yeah, yeah it's it, it, from the from the variance of one thousand dollars to one hundred seventeen thousand. What is the true value of the PSA nine? And to me, if if somebody's overpaying, if you want to call it overpaying for a PSA ten at one seventeen k, or maybe they're underpaying, there has to be uh, in between, somewhere in between. And like for I sure. said, when when you're when you're almost, uh, I guess, a hundred times less on a PSA nine, I just think that that's a little weird right i think there's mm-hmm. extreme value in in those cards like those psa nines mm-hmm. yeah no i agree with uh, all your points amazing to see that kind of sale and yeah the question i had with the si for kids um i understand that it might not be a card technically like you were mentioning john but it's definitely a collectible at this point so there's the value sure. in that right but sure. um but yeah i heard the same thing about the edges like you can't cut you know it comes from a sheet where where you could you gotta you can cut it with the hand like it's perforated edges, but if you cut it with scissors, it's it's like they won't grade it or it's not right. Like do you know what I mean? I guess like, if you, you see have like to the, cut the perforations are all flat because somebody used a pair of scissors going across. Right, and that was right. the big deal with with Tiger Woods's card. Right, is a lot of like that. I I actually uh, had to cancel a sale. I I regret it now because it was a PSA nine SI for mm-hmm. kids Tiger Woods, but this is when it was like 
I'd say 1500 bucks. I don't know what they are now. I'm, I assume it's way more expensive than 1500 bucks for a PSA mm-hmm. nine. But that was the question. Somebody messaged me and said, Hey, you, you just got that tire. That that's, that's a known like trimmed car. That's what he told me. Right. So wow. that's when right. I got, I got really kind of, um, uh, turned off with sports illustrated cards because it didn't have the perforate. It was a clean cut kind of, and it, it, I guess uh, PSA did grade it. Um, they graded it a nine and it, it didn't have the perforated, but then a BGS nine and a half oh. at the time, it, it would sell for like six, $7,000 and it would have like the perfect, you know, the perforated edges that everybody is looking for. Right. So, right. yeah, I, whenever I think about those cards, like if you had a sheet and you had to like cut it out by hand, like how nervous would you be to do oh, that? Man. <laughs> well, back then when you're a kid, you're probably like, whatever, just yeah, you know, yeah. rip it. It's clean rip. You probably yeah. do a better job as a kid. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> and now you're like just sweaty <laughs> palms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? I want to ask you, but we'll save it for another episode. Whether the bigger question for me is like, are investing in women's players an underrated play? I think they are. Yes. But yeah, we'll get into that um, more so, especially with the Olympics coming up. Um, you know, like I've read. I just want to. I think I read somewhere this bef- about this before, but that for network TV, like the higher higher ratings are for women's sports in the Olympics. So it depends on the sports itself. But um, you know, there's a lot of potential um, to invest in women players, and uh, where you could see uh, a, a good increase in the value of these cards moving forward. So absolutely, another thing to yeah, another thing to look out for. All right, with that, then let's move on to our final segment of this show. It's called Pick One. And as we normally do, we alternate between the regular edition of Pick One and the Hot Takes edition. And this week, it is the regular edition, which is just pitting two cards together. And we debate on which one we would rather invest in. All right. So, Hyung, you want to lead off? I'll lead us off as usual. <laughs> I'm going with uh, some some silvers and hollows of, of John Morant. All right. Okay. So, we're we're going with the Prism Silver John Morant PSA 10. At eighteen hundred bucks, it's around what uh, the the comps are, uh, his silver prisms, and now that we're going into you know NBA playoff season uh, soon, um, we're wondering what will happen with prices, especially if Ja, you know, takes Memphis to kind of like uh, deep into the playoffs, I guess, and he shows his talent, which I think he has been, by the way. He he's been he's been sending a message really clear, I think. Uh, when Mm -hmm. especially earlier this year when he made that statement with like Luca and Trey and he wants to be you know named and all that but uh, yeah anyways uh, I'm I'm putting that up against the optic hollow uh, PSA 10 so the the I guess the silver version of the optic image which goes for about half that price so sales were in around seven seven to eight hundred but there's not a lot out for sale right so there's only a couple on bids so i'm assuming prices will continually gradually increase as as uh basketball progresses in the next month or so um but what are your opinions you take the cheaper hollow at 800 bucks half is that the better investment or are you going with the staple prism silver that everybody wants Mm. so you guys know me i would i would pick optic hollow but for this specific question i'm going to go silver yes i'm gonna go silver i am Hmm. and um (laughs) i don't remember if i mentioned it on this pod maybe we mentioned it offline but i i'm i don't it it was a while ago i heard this and i i'm thinking it was jeff wilson in one of his very old videos um it might have been somebody else mentioning how they were having dinner after like a big card show or something and they're sitting with some Big wigs, you know, possibly from Panini. I don't know the inside scoop. But they had mentioned that some of those, he had overheard a conversation of some of those big wigs talking about how they purposely made silver in 2019 uh, a lot more, uh, less printed than previous years versus the base. So in terms of like ratio of how many were printed. Um, and this was like early on. I think this was when Prism first came out. So... If it was Jeff Wilson, he kind of posed the questions. Let's see what happens now when these grades start coming back in like 6 to 12 months from now. Let's see what happens. Now, if you look at the pop reports of, say, 
bass Luca and bass, um, sorry, silver Luca, PSA 10s. It's like whatever, 17,000 bass, 3,000 um, silver for Luca. And then if you look at Ja Morant, the bass is obviously going really high. And you'll notice the silver in comparison ratio wise, it, it is actually lower. So maybe there was some truth to that sort of like opening the ear to the insiders. So that really intrigues me about the silver, particularly just for the 2019 year. I'm not talking about any other year. So for Jaws year, and for, I, I like this, I, you know, I, I like the prism design in that particular year. So if, personally on a design level, I like it just as much as optic, but then I'm very intrigued of that print run. Um, I think it could hold pretty low. I, you know, it's probably, what, what, do you guys know what it's at right now? Yeah, uh, I'm just looking pop- up, yeah, on Pop Report for the silver PSA 10. 2000? It's at 1264. Yeah, 1264. That's like half right. of Luca's, right? But Less then the base half. the base is almost catching base up to Luca, right? almost 20,000. 20,000. something, right. yeah. There you go. So you look at the, the ratio is already a lot less than the Luca. So I think that really intrigues me. So even though the price is higher on the silver, um, it is sort of what you, you know, in Baseball World Flagship, it's the main iconic card. And if it really was printed less than normal, man, I'm all over that card. That's the one. Nice. Okay. What about you, Clark? Yeah, John convinced me to go Prism, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, you, no, uh, <laughs> um, it's it's like the question I asked last week about, or the couple of weeks ago about Luca Silver Select. Prism PSA 10. Um, versus Very the optic hollow. Oh, oh yeah, right, right, right. right. So um, essentially, we're swapping players, and yeah. I think I went with <laughs> I went with silver, but um, and I think that was harder for me to answer the Luca comparison. But with Jamarant, yeah, I'm going with silver for pretty much the same reasons as why I went with Luca. I think it's more liquid. Um, although, yeah, I think everything you just mentioned, John, it's playing out like the number of PSA 10 silvers are is a lot less than Luca's PSA 10 silver. Um, mm-hmm. And if if you look at PSA nine, maybe it's like hard grading, but yeah, PSA nine is about 2,200 um, of the silver. So, so yeah, uh, if you add them rate. all up, yeah, low gem rate. I like that. You know uh, that the PSA 10 um, is harder to get, um, and. And I'm also looking at the peak values. Like one of them sold for about five thousand at its peak. I so remember the potential that, yeah. is there, right? Like yeah, for it's sure. Almost, it's almost two and a half x versus the optic hollow, which um, I'm looking at the stats. It's sold for almost two thousand, so it's at eight hundred. So um, not as much of a gain. Um, still a good, good uh, increase if it goes back up to those levels. But I think with the higher potential of the silver prism and the lower pop count in general of silver prism PSA tens. I'm um, investing in Jamarant at that price. Nice. I uh, I agree with you guys, and I think it's going to be a sweep. Although I think like the Optic Hollow, the reason why I brought it up is if it's in your budget, I still think both are great. Love it. Great, great buy, prices. Sure. So Absolutely. it's like it's one of those things where both are a great buy, in my opinion. And if if it fits your budget, definitely I I, I would go Prism as well, based on what both of you guys said. And I kind of wanted to put that out there too because I think. Um, I think it's a good uh, perspective that you guys brought, and that's exactly why I did it. Is because I knew, um, I knew the optic was cheaper, but I, 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 th- I thought the prism silver of Ja Morant is is a great buy. It's a great card, and 2019 prism is probably one of my favorites, uh, favorite designs that they've released in the past, you know, five six years. Um, or even all, all of prism, maybe you know. I and I know that's a bold statement, but uh. Yeah, I think uh, the silver prism, like I said, I've monitored that card. I've even seen Lucas prism go up to 8k, uh which is which is which is insane. Um but yeah, I just think that that's going to be an iconic card and it's it's I'm even more bullish on it because what John said about the print run um uh, being at 1200 cuz I think Zion's silvers are over 2000 now. Uh, I would imagine so. So, um right. seeing that on Ja, I think it's uh, very comforting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, Sweet. like yeah, like like you <laughs> mentioned, uh, having the, said that practically, like in real life, I'd probably go for the optic hollow because that's more <laughs> within our budget. Yeah, within exactly. Budget. You're like, ah, uh, that's so US. What, what's what's USD at? That's our question. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, yeah. John. 
So in honor of Brady's uh, retirement, I'm going to put the two, arguably the two largest goats in sports history against each other. So 2000 Brady Bowman Chrome Refractor BGS 9.5 versus the 86 Fleer Jordan PSA 10. If you could have one shot at one of these all-time grail cards, uh, both selling for around, in and around the 300,000 mark, uh, I think the Brady's a little bit more right now obvious, for obvious reasons. But um, yeah, if you could have a shot at one of these, which one are you picking? I'll go first. Um, I'll go for Brady. <laughs> and, um, you know, like, I was listening to, it might be sports card nonsense, but another po- another sports card podcast where they ask Golden or another auction house, like, they keep getting Fleer 1986 Jordans. Like, right. it's a little bit scary, the supply that's actually out there that hasn't come in yet to be graded. And, you know, like, it just seems like, yeah, it's an iconic card, no doubt, right? And MJ is, I, I think, the greatest athlete of all time over Brady, in my opinion. But I'm going for the card in this case. And they're both goats, so, um, but I'm going for the card. And the Bowman Chrome Refractor, like, if you ever see it in person, it's, it looks really nice. Like, the shine that comes off of it. It's the early it's, 2000s, like, refractors. They're different. They hit different. Amazing, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 shiny. <laughs> um, <laughs> and... And uh, yeah, I like I like that. Uh, I think I don't know definitively, but I'm gonna I'm gonna wager that it's the, in terms of pop count, it's a lot less than the 1986 Fleer. So I'm going after the card itself. Although I think MJ is a better player, but um, yeah, I think in terms of value over time, especially long term, I th- I could see the Brady growing much higher, whereas um, MJ would plateau if not decrease a little bit to due to the supply demand. Right. Speaking of pod count, did you guys see, I think it was PSA had an IG post where they posted like their their top 10 submitted cards, mm-hmm. particular cards over the last, in 2021. And 86 Fleer was on that list. <laughs> really? The Jordan, like, yeah, it was yeah. on the, it was like, I think it was on the top 10 list. I could be wrong, but I remember being like shocked. I'm like, how, what? Like, how is the 86 see? Fleer <laughs> on a list of most submitted cards to PSA? Like, that didn't make any sense to me, especially Fleer's modern just cards. Been pumping it, pump, pumping them out <laughs> in the know, last man. two years. I don't know, yeah, I don't I don't know where people are that. getting these boxes we, 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 or like. Clark, you might have to edit that out. Does Fleer still <laughs> exist? <laughs> I think they bought out by one of the companies. So. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Crazy. Um, it makes me nervous. Yeah, no, yeah, so it makes me not want to say 86, Jordan. <laughs> but yeah, ref- the the Brady Refractor, would, I would have I would have said just because exactly what you said, Clark, it's the card more so than anything, you know, and it's one of the parallels, the very, very rare parallels that any Brady card uh, has. So for me, it's, it's more of the scarcity at this point, right? It's like I'll probably be able to find a Jordan PSA 10, you know, somewhere, but being able to find a a gem uh gem mint you know brady refractor i think it's pretty insane so i'm i'm definitely going uh with the brady refractor mm. <laughs> it's a sweep <laughs> i know is, i think um <laughs> you know what uh I, I think you know truth truth be told if we were actually in a scenario to spend 300,000 and purchase one of these cards the brady investment wise would make all the sense in the world because there's a lot of indicators in the future to possibly make this card spike a little bit hall of fame announcements yada 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 so i think even if fleer jordan is your ultimate goal you can buy the brady the brady chrome refractor now and then when it spikes sell it and use the profits to buy get into the jordan so that would make the most sense um maybe just to save my own (laughs) my own (laughs) 1v1 but, you know, growing up in that, that junk wax era, growing up in the, the Jordan Kobe era, like Jordan is my all time, like 86 Fleer, all time, all time card. Like I would love to have that card in any garbage condition like that. Hmm. Anyone who collected in our age group, that was the card, like the card. If somebody had that, you were like, oh, my gosh, like such this and such serious. has this yeah. guy has the Jordan rookie like his dad got it from when he opened packs back in the day or whatever right so i think that all of the nostalgia everything involved and i have one shot at one of these two cards 
Uh, I want to say I want to pick the 86 Fleer based on my love for collecting and Jordan and everything. And, you know, as much as that PSA report about the Jordans getting submitted is scary, when you look at the PSA 10 pop report, even though there were 25,000 86 Fleer submitted, I don't think that PSA 10 number moved barely at all, right? So that gives you some comfort that, okay, yeah, there might be a boatload of PSA 6s out now and a boatload of PSA 3s, but that PSA 10 number at around 300, you can rest assured that that number won't move too much in the next forever, uh, the rest of our lifetime. So I think for an all-time collector card, like this is, if you're in a category in the high roller space, this is like a must have, like everybody is going to have like, this is a must have card in your collection. Um, so I don't, I think 300 pop is not enough. I still think it's a, it's could go up just as much as the Brady refractor. So I am, yeah, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to pick the 86 Fleer Jordan. <laughs> I'll be the one to do it. <laughs> no, th- those are good points though, for sure. That the PSE 10 is what makes it scarce. Right. But all right, good one. Okay, I'll round off the pick one segment. And I'm looking ahead towards the World Cup in November in Qatar. And um, I'm going to ask this because I'm kind of, I kind of want to make a soccer play at some point. Hmm. You know, this early in the year is probably the time to make it if you're going to make it. So uh, let's uh, throw out Kylian Mbappe, uh, one of the hot soccer stars playing right now for France. His World Cup Silver Prism, PSA 10. Uh, which is going last sold for about 3600 and pop counts 253 versus his Topps Chrome UEFA Refractor, the 2017, I believe, which is going for a little bit more, 4100 and the pop count is 138 so a little bit less as well. Man, I, I, I'm going to go with uh, the Topps Chrome uh, Champions League, uh, the 2017. Um, I do like his 2018 World Cup, but it is a World Cup card, so... I think uh, over time the the refractor of the Champions League card will 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 be stronger, especially with the half the pop count that the World Cup uh, does have. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go uh, Topps Chrome uh, refractor. I think that's gonna be a huge, huge card uh, moving mm. forward. Okay. Uh, same. I'm picking the Topps Chrome UEFA, UEFA refractor. It's 2017 versus 2018. When it comes comes down to it. Most collectors are gonna want the earlier earlier version, no matter how nice the 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 following versions are. Um, I don't know if there's any truth to this. This is just completely my own observation when I was getting back into sports cards. Um, as you all know, like at the beginning of the pandemic, um, soccer wasn't as popping as it is now. And I remember looking at cards, and I think, you know, when people started looking back at at soccer and they started to investigate it was easy to go think about prism prism was basketball was king everyone was looking at prism i'll i'll admit it the first thing i tried to type in was soccer prism and boom the world cup came out right so i think that world cup set in 2018 had a ton of exposure when soccer was getting on the map and as soccer really did get on the map, people started to really do their research and realize, oh, wait, guys like M- Mbappe have a card in 2017, Topps Chrome, and then they have a rookie card in whatever the his actual rookie card is with that split with the with the other guy. That's like 2014 Pinini or whatever that, that is. Um, right. I'm t- totally butchering it. But I think as people started to really do their research, they found out, oh, it's not World Cup Prism is the end-all, be-all. Be all. There's all these other cards that exist. So... Just my observation, no idea if there's any truth to that, but I feel like the World Cup prism in the early, early years um, really had a big shine. Like everybody was looking at that set that was like the king set to go to. And That 2018 World Cup set is monstrous though. You're right. Like that 2018 World Cup is absolutely monstrous. Right. Low print run, all of that jazz. Low print run, super expensive for a box now. Yeah, like, totally. We're talking like five Gs for a box, maybe probably more for a hobby right. box in 2018 World Cup, right? So, yeah. So I mean, it's still big, but I think bottom line, end of the day, the the UEFA refractor lower pop, it's slightly more in terms of money to spend. But I think it's worth it, man. People are gonna look at the the 
they're going to prefer 2017 over 2018. I, I know I would as a collector. So, yeah, UEFA refractor for me. Okay. Um, yeah, this was a hard one. I keep going back and forth, but I like all your points. I'm actually going to go with the World Cup because mm. I, I think it largely it also depends on when you want to flip it, right? Like if right. you want to flip it this year, I think if you have the World Cup card, it might be easier to flip for for a good price. Good point. Yeah, for um, later this year, depend you know, especially if France does well. Um, you know, he's in his um, country uniform r- rather than the club uniform, and who knows where Mbappe is going to play in the future? There's always questions about that too. Um, so, so yeah, I think and the like you mentioned, Hyung too, like that World Cup 2018 is is an iconic set. So like I think if people have other players that they like of that World Cup set, you know, uh, and they might not be able to collect the full set. But they might want to target other players from that same set, so there might be demand that way as well. And I'm just looking at card ladder as well. Like, who knows if we'll go to the peak? But the peak of the tops Chrome UEFA refractor was about just over ten thousand. And I don't know if it's wow. what you said about, um, you know, Panini getting the shine um, early on. But the the highest sale of that card, the World Cup silver, was a uh, uh, twelve thousand. So definitely higher. But yeah. Both amazing cards. I think I would, I would, you know, whatever the better deal is at the time, I would probably go for it. But in terms of flipping, I think there's more opportunity this year, at least, in mm-hmm. the World Cup Silver Prism. All right. Uh, thanks to everyone listening to this episode and this podcast of Cards to the Moon. Like we said at the top of the show, if you guys have any questions or, or uh, anything that you want us to address in future episodes, please DM us, message us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, we would appreciate if you do so. You get a notification of uh, every new episode that comes out on Tuesdays. That's all. That's all for this week. We'll see you guys then next week. Hey, thanks for listening to Cards to the Moon. We'd really appreciate you subscribing to our podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And you can also connect with each of us on Instagram at 5 Card Guys. Or you can follow Hyung at Integrity Sports Cards or John at Trade You at Recess. You can also check us out at fivecardguys.com. Thanks again and hope to connect soon.